Yes, hooray there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another rowing chat. And this one's been a long time in coming, but I'm really happy today to be joined by 50% of the world's most famous rowing crew for the past decade, the Kiwi Pair. Eric. Thank you, Wyatt. I'm good. Hey, let's kick off with you just telling the listeners who you are and what you've done in rowing. Um, yeah, simple Kiwi bloke down from New Zealand. Um, I took up rowing for a bit of fun, spiraled out of control, uh, and then, yeah, ended up one of the most successful combinations ever in history. Um, we didn't really start out that way, uh, but, yeah, we, we just went out like everybody else, win a few races, have a bit of fun, um, and then, yeah, it got really serious. So we've been very lucky to have won eight world championship titles in three different boat classes uh, and obviously two Olympic gold medals. Um, and I've been to the Olympics four times, so, you know, you put that into perspective. There was a couple before that where nothing eventuated um, and, yeah, and then ultimately in the last few, um, you know, we finally hit our straps and I'm always going to say we learned how to row properly uh, and we were able to go out there and, and win a lot of titles um, and, yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Brilliant. The best endorsement possible for the sport we all enjoy. Oh, exactly. Let's kick off with talking about the Olympics. Um, everybody says it's the pinnacle of an athletic career, but I'm quite interested in your first and second Olympics because I'm guessing nobody expects to get into a final or to win medals in their first Olympics in rowing. What were your experiences like? Uh, to be fair, just making it to the Olympics is hard enough. Um, you know, I wasn't in my first Olympics, I wasn't even like, qualified. Uh, so 2003, we look back to the Milan World Champs and I was in a Cox 4 when that was still around in the program and that was just seen as a development crew. And we we basically went overseas to have a bit of fun, see what we could do in the Cox 4. Um, and so, yeah, when you when you get the opportunity to try and make the squad, you know, because there's always pretty much a squad and there'll be a certain number of people that will get picked out of that for the, uh, for the Olympic team. We were lucky we had the four in the pair that had qualified. Um, so we had a squad of like 10 guys uh, going for six spaces, basically. And it was just came down to what you did over the 2003 to four summer. Uh, and I just had to, to work my butt off, um, do what you were told, not get, you know, lucky enough not to get injured over that period and just be able to produce the results when it mattered. Uh, and that's, that's ultimately what you what gets you selected is your performance over a period of time. You know, a lot of people say, yeah, but there's a selection with Gatter. But a lot of the times, if you can be the consistent performer throughout that period of time, and then when you come to the selection trials that's seen upon, and then you, you still are able to produce here, there or thereabouts, um, you'll always get put into that crew. And so that was that was me in the first one, was just trying to make the Olympics. Finally did that. Um, and then it was about going over there and, and just having a bit of fun because you know we we qualified eleventh out of thirteen um, for the for the um, for the Olympics in two thousand and four. So we had no real expectations, um, and then we were lucky enough to to go through and we had a terrible lose soon. I think we were ninth, um, and then of course to turn up to the Olympic Games and it's basically just a matter of of seeing how you can progress through the rounds. And um, you know we had a great time um, in our heat. We got second to the Australians, uh, went into the semi final. Um, and we we tried to go toe to toe with the British, um, but we finished a link down on them, and then ultimately that put us into the uh, into the final. So even just making it to the final, and then hey, you know we got last in the final and spot fifth actually got spat out the back. But uh, in all fairness, it was just an experience and knowing that hey, okay, we can one or one two races we can be right up there, but we just didn't have the sustainability to do it for for that longer period of time. So that was the first experience of the Olympics. And then ultimately the second one in Beijing, uh, we'd learned things from 04, 05, 06. We had a, a bloody dead heat in the semi-final. That's a big story, that one. We had a dead heat in the semi-final, had to re-race, missed out on the final, ended up ninth place, I think, overall. Um, and then ultimately went into the qualifying in 2007 in Munich, um, and we ended up winning the four. So we had a, we had a fantastic year 2007. Uh, but we just didn't know how to replicate it. You know, we, we were doing everything we thought possible. Okay, Hamish had 
been hit by a truck out on a cycling ride, um, you know, which was unfortunate. So that put us back a little bit, but we just couldn't find the magic, you know, the the what was making us go fast in 2007. And we finally started getting some inroads just before the Olympics, but it was too late. You know, we we had a tough semi-final, um, you know, the Palms, the Australians and the French, and they went on to get gold, silver and bronze. You know, we were four. So, you know, even, even though we won the B final, you'd still like to think, hey, we were better than better than seventh place. But there was that's history. You know, we were always going to be the seventh. Um, and so that experience to me was of being in the team for a long period of time, and we were going there with an expectation of coming away with a medal, um, or you know, at least being in the final. Uh, and we missed out on that completely. So that was sort of the tipping point of do I continue on this? Because I've done what is it like thirteen hundred and something days between the Olympics to Olympics. And then you're like, man, I'm going to sit here and do another 1,300 odd days until I get another opportunity to do it. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that was a real tough one. And, and that's basically how the peer combination was formed. So the deep frustration of having made an Olympic final and then failed to make an Olympic yeah. final. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's and that's what it comes down to. As I said, you know, to be, to not only get a qualifying position, you know, if you're in that qualifying team or not, it doesn't necessarily count you in as being in the team for the Olympics. So you've not only got to be in a certain qualifying number, which we know is limited, um, and then you've also got to be the best in your country. Um, So there's all of these things that just add up, and that's why the opportunity to compete at the Olympics, not only in rowing but in any other sport, is very difficult. Um, It's difficult to actually get to those positions to be able to do it. Um, yeah, my Zach's just coming in for a. If we get interrupted, it's because Zach's coming in to eat something. Um, and yeah, and so basically, you've just got to look at it and say, hey, you know, if you get the opportunity once, um, that's amazing enough. If you get the chance to do it multiple times, then you know that's awesome. What are you getting, mate? He's getting ice cream. <laughs> Excellent. So, how did you and Hamish hit it off in that form? Years together before you decided the two of you could go off on your own. You had two other crewmates who both retired. Yeah, so we we were in the four with um, a guy Carl Meyer and James Dellinger, and uh, they were in the four. Carl had been in the four since two thousand and three, um, and I raced with him at the uh, at the Athens Olympics. And then, um, yeah, basically we went through that that. Uh, Beijing period and both the guys were sort of like oh you know I want to take a little bit of a break um, and while we've been training in the pair together uh, training in the four together we always went in the pair together and Hamish and I were the fastest of it of the sort of you know the four combinations um, and so it just sort of developed from there and um, I guess just skipping forward a little bit from that um, you know people ask me they go you know have you got any regrets or what ifs or what would you have liked to have done in the sport um, and, and it's a real curly one, but I, I would love to have seen what Hamish and I could have done in 2008 if we'd been in the pair. Mm-hmm. Because we, we, we raced against George and Nathan a couple of times while we were in, in the pair, split up from the four. Um, and we, we tailed them both times. You know, there was one race we won comfortably low 620s on Carapero by about eight or nine seconds, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, it sort of just sits there and goes, man, imagine if we'd actually, but at the time we were in the four, you know, that was our boat. That's what we wanted to try and win because obviously we were champions. Um, but looking back on it, it's like, well, how would we have gone against, you know, like Jerome Duncan and Scott and, and um, you know, and it would have been like, oh man, yeah, I don't know whether we would have been right up there to, to try and, and win, but I definitely think we would have been right in the race for that medal in Beijing. Um, so that's, that's only one thing going, you know, from there you're like, you know, maybe if we'd done that. But then in saying that, uh, you know, potentially we might have done that and then said, oh, cool, now let's do something different. You know, it's because that's what people try and do. You know, they try and win something and then go, oh, I'll do another challenge now. So, okay. Well, being a Briton, having seen the red grey Pinsent pair and then the Pinsent Cracknell pair and recognising that the entire world was basically deciding you either are going to race these guys who've beaten everyone else, and then they retire and suddenly there's a void. And then people <laughs> race in to try and fill the void. As you know, when you guys retired, the Slovenians gave it a crack and didn't quite come off the way they expected, I expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you and Hamish, you are two of the most different psychologies almost possible. 
from those early yeah. days were you always buddies oh uh, yeah yeah um oh it's just like anything you know you've got to the, the biggest thing and i tell it to everybody is you don't have to like you know i like Hamish, but you don't have to like people you're in a crew with you just got to have trust in them you know and you've got to have a hundred percent trust no matter what you're doing um you know and we had we had completely different lives you know when when hamish came into the four in 2006 like um i was getting married at the end of 2006 and, and he was like a 19 year old kid basically you know and he was just coming out um footloose fancy free and you know flatting with everyone we had our own place we were living together so it was just completely different lives and that's really how it sort of stayed that whole period of time it probably worked so well because we had 100 percent trust in each other we're really good friends but it wasn't like i said oh mate do you want to go get a coffee or should we go out for a beer or anything like that we just kept our separate lives like our lives separate um and the personal lives outside of it just didn't come into the equation so i think that's what worked really well over that period of time because um we didn't stand on each other's feet um you know and obviously as well we didn't really have too many like conflicts that we had to like deal with um you know and i think that's probably one of the best situations is if you don't have to like deal with too many conflicts and there's no conflict resolution and you know things will just go could be really rosy if i was to shape your personality and his are you married um, we, we are pretty, <laughs> no. we've got 100 jobs eating house at home. Um, yeah, we've Ow. got, um, like we're, we are really just different yeah, we'll people because I'm an optimistic sort of guy, um, you know, try to be really positive. Um, and Hamish is really pessimistic, you know, he's worried about things all the time. You know, oh, we're not doing this right, we're not doing that right, this isn't going to work, oh. that's not going to work. Uh, are we going fast enough? We're not. And I'm like, yeah, it feels pretty good. Let's just keep rolling, you know. Um, and, and that was that was pretty much how we worked. But he's all like, because of that perfectionism as well, it sort of brought us into a middle ground where I was having to look at a little bit more of making things more perfect, um, and he was just having to relax a little bit more. Um, but I guess, and, and Hamer summed it up one time. And anyway, we we did a speech, and he just came out. And he goes, you know, when I first got on the pier there. At, I was like, you know what? I'm the best rower in the country, and I think Eric's the next best, next best rower. And I was like, hey, I thought I was the best, and you were the next best. You know, like that was pretty much how you look at it. And then ultimately, from there, if you take the two people that think they're the best and you put them together, and then you and then you sort of both sitting there going, okay, we want to win, then something's going to something is going to come from it. Um, and that's really where we we went, um, and that's how we took it. So let's let's talk about Hamish because he's not here to answer back. Um, yeah. So if he doesn't come on my name, you'll be like, oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> um, with a, a perfectionist in the boat, their constant worrying and 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 finessing of things can be a real focus because you're there's a technical point or something and you're focusing on it. How do you moderate? Um, your behaviour. Did you always just blend and go with what he was suggesting? Oh, we we blended and, and went with both of what either of us brought to the table. Um, ultimately, and it's probably a little bit of a downfall. New Zealand it was just historically work hard. You know, put the blade and work as hard as you can all the time. And there wasn't a huge amount of finesse around it. And it was only until sort of Chris Nielsen um, came and coached us while we were in the four. And I mean, it was like the first day he said, stop, 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 what the hell are you guys doing? He goes, you're just working way too hard and you're getting no boat run for what you're doing. And it just looks terrible. And then he was like, we just we just cut the stroke back and went down and down and down. And so that's one thing with Hamish, you know, like he, he would work really hard um, all the time. And so a lot of times it was just like, okay, it doesn't feel great, but guess what, we're going fast, you know? And his philosophy, and, and it was sort of our philosophy all the way through as well, is that you know you can, you need to do the hard work because if you turn up to world champs and you know and go to race, you can change technical aspects pretty quickly. You know, like if you have a really bad first race and you're like we hit the front way too much or we were missing it, we were rushing the slide, whatever, you can change that from race to race and gain quite a few seconds, right? But if you haven't done the work, you can't go, oh shit, we've missed about 500 k's of training. Nah, can't get that in tomorrow, you know, and and that's literally how it goes. So if you've done the hard, hard work and the and the work up to it, those final little things of finessing along the way um, can be done quite quickly at the end, you know, in that last week. 
Um, and that's sort of the way that we, we tried to do it. And, you know, I think as it progressed through our years, we basically just tried to have a really high standard while we were training. Um, and we and that's probably where the critiquing always came from and was just the fact that he wanted it perfect and you get back from a row, no, no, I didn't feel nice or you just felt like you were in front of me all the time and, you know, I couldn't really get a, a hold of it. Um, but, those, you know, those are the things you need to get better because, you know, the moment you sit there going, no, I felt it right, you probably get complacent. So that's where the mix of us came through. And I probably had a little bit of a reason and say, mate, it's a Friday afternoon. We've already clocked up 200 plus Ks this week and we've still got two sessions to go tomorrow. We're going to be pretty tired. You know, you saw the wind out there. That picked up. It was horrible. You know, we're so slow coming back. And he'd be like, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, so you, there was there was sort of two schools of thoughts as we went along. Um, and, and that's, you know, those are just the things that, that made the combination of the Kiwi pair go so well. Did you get to the point where you could look at the set of his back and you knew what he was thinking? Uh, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, you could you could just tell. And I think we never really had, and it's over the whole period of time, maybe it just didn't show, but we never really had a time where I'd come down to training and go, you know what, I'm so tired, I'm exhausted, I'm not, I'm just having a really crap day. Um, and Hamish would be the same. You know, he'd be like, okay, well, you know, let's we'll get this done and, we'll, you know, we'll find some goodness out of it. And then it would be the flip side as well. He'd come down and go, look, oh, I'm just so tired and my back's sore and whatever. And I'd be like, okay, well, let's just get some good work out of it and then and then be done. Um, whereas, yeah, we never had the time we were both sitting there going, nah, nah let's just not go out today. <laughs> Plus the fact that our coach, if we'd ever done that, would have just destroyed us. Um, but, yeah, those those are probably the key elements to, to how it actually worked quite well was by having us not, you know, pretty much on on fire, at least one of us all the time. That's brilliant. And just going over your entire rowing career, right back to schoolboy, did you ever have a stand-up row with somebody either in a boat or after getting out of a boat? Oh, yeah, we had a couple with the coach. He had us and had me by the scruff of the neck one time. Um, and then, yeah, just before the Olympics and oh, the year out from the Olympics in 2012, he had another go at us, um, just lost the plot one, one day and swore in black and blue at us, you if and this and see and that and whatever else came under the sun. And I and probably didn't help that I started laughing because I thought it was so funny. It was so like, what the hell, you know, what brought this on? Um, yeah, but no, as, as I say, look, never, I've never really had anything like that with any other people we've rode with, um, you know, any of the, co well, you know, except for Dick. But, um, yeah, because it's just not productive, you know. And as I say, like, if, if you're not enjoying someone that's in your boat, like, Problem is, you just got to you you know you got to work with them, and so you just got to find a way to get around it. And and I and I'd say it's the same in, in every program around the world that there's people that you know they get on and respect each other and have trust, but it's not like they're going to say, oh you know come around let's have dinner and let's do this and I like, how about we go to the movies together? Um, because there there's just so many different personalities that make up boats. Um, it's just it's just how it works. Let's talk about coaches. You've obviously had several coaches who you really resonated with. Which ones would you pick out as having been particularly influential? Oh, if we go influential, probably the most influential was Chris Nielsen. Mm -hmm. So Chris had been in America, coached with Mike Tatey and the guys, uh, I think through that 2000, early 2000s, you know, mid 2000 period, 2004. Um, and then he came back to New Zealand um, and he coached us through to a World Championship gold. Um, and then obviously went off and did some Cambridge um, boat race stuff in the UK. Um, but he just came with a sense of, of boat feel, you know, which we didn't have prior. We'd trained hard, pushed hard, you know, just work your ass off sort of hard. And he just came and he said, look, there's just a finesse. You know, you guys are wasting so much boat speed. You know, and you're all fit, you're all strong. Um, just, you know, relax and, and get some run out of it. And so he just made, he just gave us an appreciation of what we were actually doing. Um, and it did, you know, we were still pretty young and we were still pretty green. And then, but just over the years, we just found a combination of work. We found a way and an appreciation of actually how to row. Um, and so that for me was, was uh, that, that's probably been the, the best thing because you can take that from, from then to any other coach and you think about the appreciation of the boat feel um, from their perspective. And so then, you know, 
obviously after that we went with Dick Tonks and we could take that boat feel that we had had with Chris and take it into the brutal training environment that was the Dick Tonks regime. Um, you know, and it was just, if you survive this, you'll probably win. Um, you know, and it was, as I say, like brutal is probably an understatement of what it was. Um, and yeah, and so his, his, I guess, training ethics and, and um, oh, yeah, just, just the ability to, to go past your your limits like two or three times and you're like, I would never have done this if I'd had to do it myself um, was was amazing. You know, and then ultimately going on to Noel, he, he, we just had a great collaboration with him. You know, he had done a lot with the programs in Aussie, um, you know, coming to New Zealand. He just wanted to work with us and say, look, what's working for you guys? How, how do we do this? How do we keep winning? Um, and then he said, because you need to be doing this first and foremost, and, but if you want to do anything yourselves, let me know. Um, and so we had a great collaboration. We kept the training high. We brought a little bit more scientific, physiological stuff into the program, um, but he still had a great technical eye for how things were working. And ultimately, that collaboration just worked really well. That's brilliant. And, of course, it just shows that Noel was a school teacher, doesn't it? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> now... I've been told that uh, that physiological side came from a man called Dan Plumes. Yeah, Dan Plumes, yep. Tell us a bit about him and his approach, because he was in the New Zealand programme for, was it three years, and he's now gone on to working with Hamish in the cycling. Yeah, five, five, five years. I think he came on just before London. Um, yeah, so prior, literally prior to, put to Dan coming in the programme, our programme was designed, and probably a lot like this, somewhere in the world, Coach goes, this is what I did. This is what I've done. These are the... Because effectively, if we, if we skip backwards a bit, effectively a rowing program is a one-year experiment and then you do it again and you do it again. So we're sort of like lab rats where they go, well, maybe we'll, we'll do, you know, instead of doing 80, 20, you know, historical training to U2 stuff, why don't we do like 60, 40, you know, in one of the years we did. And then one year we did like 90, 10. And we did like hardly any speed work but we just did so many Ks at like a really intense 20 to 22 rating, but we still won, you know, and then then there was a the flip side and then, then we went back to that sort of 70, 30 and then we were still going fast. And so it works for some people and it didn't work for others, you know, and that was what he was just sort of finding out at the same time. So when Dan came along, um, he was like, you know, look, you've got a great base. Um, and we were like, yeah, but, you know, we, we want to work on these areas because over the years, you know, when we first started out, we had an amazing first 500, an amazing sprint. Um, and then as the years went on and we probably lost a little bit of that power, we started getting slower in the first 500. We still had it up our sleeve to do the thing, but we produced this amazing ability to like sub-split races. You know, like we'd do a 135 first 500 and then we could do a 134 and then a 133, you know, and like nobody else in the world could do it. No one, you know, and that was basically setting us apart from anybody else. Um, and, yeah, and it would just came down to, like, the physiological stuff we were doing. And, and some of it was brutal, you know. Some of the training, um, you know, you in the end, we had to trust in what Dan was actually saying. And it even came down to, like, the warm-ups we were doing. And, like, we've turned heads when we were warming up for races because, you know, our he said, look, you know, what are, what are you normally doing? And we said, oh, you know, it takes us about sort of three or 400 metres to get warmed up in a race. And he's like, you stop doing enough. You know, you're so fit. But if you do 20 minutes of work, like really good solid work beforehand, it's not going to feed you, you know, because you're used to doing 90 minutes and you're still going as fast as you were. So we were doing these bike warm-ups. You do like five to 10 minutes spinning, it, getting the sweat on, and then you do these like sprint pieces. You know, it was like three minutes, two minutes, one minute, and then rotate it again. And so we'd come off sweating, dripping with sweat, puffing, panting, almost getting up to like sub-max rate. And then you go on the water and do like just short speed work. But of course, people would come past and the bikes are spinning like crazy on the on the um, on the wind trainer, and people were like, man, what are they? They're still got to go out and race. Um, but he said it just it's going to prime your body, and you're going to get out there into the race, and you're going to feel amazing. And like the first time we did it, I remember finishing the race, going, you know what? It actually, made me feel really good. And damn it, now I have to keep doing this every time. Um, yeah, and so that's basically how how it went about, and then. He just said, look, if you want to increase your, your endurance, you've got to do long endurance pieces on the rowing machine. And he was like, Hamish, you know, if you need to, you need to pick up your power, endure, like your power, 
So you're going to do shorter, faster bursts on the rowing machine at like max sort of, of area. So we started doing different things, either of us. So it was never, a few times we'd do the same workouts, but we'd have two workouts a week on the rowing machine that were just specifically for me and one for Hamish. Um, and and they, they, they seemed to work, you know, no matter how, like one of them was just insane. Um, like we had to do, we did seven one minute pieces at like max and it was, and I was like, you want maxes and like I can hold, you know, maybe one sub one twenty for the whole time. And he goes, No, no, you've got to hit your maximum number as soon as you can. And you've just got to hold the speed for as long as you can. So he goes, at the end of it, you'll probably be above one thirties and, and really lactated up. And he goes, But that's what I want. That's that's how you that's how you break your physiology and make it change. And so we did seven repeats of that at like there was a five minute break in between. And like I hit 22 millimoles of lactate on the last one because I, and as I say, like the first five strokes, I think I've got it maybe under 120. And then I was ending up on 150s, like, because I just could not, the body was just out of it. But then the next time we went to do it a week later, it was easier. You know, and that's the thing. That's what physiology does is it just adapts your body into learning new things. And as I say, like, if I'd done seven one minute pieces, I would have just done seven one minute pieces that made me like, you know, mid 120s average and said, yeah, yeah, that was good. But the way that he wanted them done, which changes your body, because that's effectively what you're doing. Um, and so that collaboration between the physiology, the coach's experience, putting it all together with what we feel, you know, if we were like, look, we, we feel a bit tired, or we've we've only been doing too much U2 stuff, we need some more speed work in there. If you bring all of that together, you have a, a fantastic team. And between, you know, between Dan, Hamish and I and Noel, we just found a really good mix that worked for us, you know. Might not work for everyone else, um, but whatever it did, it worked really well for us. That's a, a fantastic balance of, um, mm. of expertise and skill. But, of course, it was built on the fact that both of you had eight to ten years of yep. rowing experience as juniors, under 23s and so on. So think back to your first time when you were rowing with the big boys. There's a nice bit in the, your book where you talk about trialling for the Avon Rowing Club first date and you're the schoolboy, and there are some returning olympians also trialing for this uh, eight how did you cope with that because several times you must have been the boy in the squad what did you oh, yeah so um you know like historically the way that it was looked upon was just you know like respect your elders you know like they've been around they've done it they know what they're talking about so you just like they barked at you to do something you did it um and so that was that was just the way that I had been brought up in the rowing world from a young age, just looked upon and, and aspired to be what these these older, more experienced guys were. And yeah, when I got the opportunity to go and, and be part of like the eight, um, it was basically just a matter of like, okay, get into the get into it, shut your mouth, do what you were told, um, and ultimately you could see if you could you could make it. Um, and that was that was how it was. It was there was sort of that element of fear, like don't let these people down. Um, you know, make sure you're doing it properly. Um, and that was and that was really what you learned in those first parts was just you don't really have the experience in doing what you're doing. So just do what they tell you to do. Um, and and that was that was basically how I had to do it as a as a youngster. And then of course, when you were the older, more experienced athlete, um, yeah. did you notice yourself um, becoming? Yeah, I picked on Hamish hey, when he first came in the floor. I was like, mate, anything that went wrong, you were like on oh, UV, UV's making it go bad. Uh, but yeah, and but little did we know, we started going better once we got Hamish in the boat. So it was, uh, yeah, it, it's it's just one of those situations. And I'm sure it still happens now. You know, you get a younger and experienced person that comes in the boat and, and you just think, oh, well, they don't have as much experience as I do. So if it starts going wrong, then potentially it's probably them not being able to keep up or whatever. But you know, it's, it's just sort of how it's perceived, and I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Mm. And of course, one of the things that shows the utter professionalism and maturity of your coaching staff is the fact that they treat you differently, and you're allowed some input. There are certainly mm. uh, coaches who just expect yeah. athletes to shut up. That took us a long time. You know, we had to win. We had to win five Olymp uh, five world championships and one Olympic gold medal before we even allowed that. Um, and that is one thing that I, I definitely I want to put out there as well, that, yeah, we got to that level because of what we had achieved. Um, but prior to that, we we almost had zero input. You know, we were still just doing what we were told. 
Um, and because ultimately the coach wants you to win, you want to win, the organization wants you to win, everything, you know, everything's around you wanting to win. Um, and so you've just got to have faith in everything that's been put in front of you. And you also have to sort of sit there and be accountable and say, look, and sit down, you know, at the start of the season and say, I want to win, you know, like whether it's something, in a, you know, in America where you want to go to Henley in the UK and you're like, well, I want to win. And they go, okay, if you really want to win, this is how we've got to do it. And you could put it down on paper and go, wow, wow, uh, okay. And then you just have to get your head around it and say, well, if that's what I have to do to win, then that's what I have to do to win. Um, and as I say, like, you know, if a lot of people just started not believing what we were doing with, with Dick and the pair, you know, as I say, like some of this 90-20 when we are doing U2 stuff, we went like nearly two months with with averaging over 300 k's a week, you know, and and you just like it was it was blowing our minds. We'd do 30 k in the morning, might do a 16 k in the, in the middle of the day, then like 20 to 16 in the afternoon, and it was brutal. And like you were just so tired all the time, and it was just like oh my god. But it was just the experiment that he was doing. And then ultimately, when we started like freshening up a bit and then doing speed work, it was like ah, oh, it's easy, you know. It's and that it's what it is. You just push yourself past. Because all you effectively want to do is make it easier on yourself. And if you can produce the same amount of output but actually do it easier, then you feel easier and then you can actually put more output to feel worse, that makes sense. Um, and then ultimately you'll be faster than another crew and that's basically the key. Did you ever do his last man standing outing? Um, we've done a couple and, like, it still ranks probably – it's probably still almost number one on my list where – we, so we were in we were in Haswinkle and it was I'm trying to think, I think it was 2010, 2010, maybe 2011. I think it was one of the years and we trained in Belgium, great place to train. Um, and we've been doing 500 meter pieces and it's 500 on, 200 off, uh, 250 off. And he'll just say whether it's a standing or a start, you know, whatever. And you just roll down the course. And if you finish early, then you roll down, ready, start on the line at the 250 and go again, whatever. Um, and so basically, over the few coming weeks preceding that, most people do 8 to 10, and then we started doing like 10 to 15. And one day we did like 20, and we thought, wow, this is, this, this is pretty crazy. Um, you know, and it was it was a pretty decent session. So we're thinking, man, if we did 20 last week, we might do like 28 this time. So, of course, you prepared for it. We had a, like, I had a litre and a half of water and a couple of gels, and, and that disappeared by about 18. We ended up doing 38. Yeah, and so we just kept going, kept going, and we lost count, kept going, kept going. I'm looking at my watch going, you know, we got on the water here at 8 o'clock and it's now 11.30 or whatever it was, and I'm like going. Um, and, like, we were all looking across because we're training with Mahi, Emma, and the woman's quad, so we're pretty much just taking all the lanes going up and down our lane. And we were just shaking our head, you know, because we were going slow, everyone was going slow. And, and it wasn't, it was like literally until, and like we had no idea. No one's going to say, how many more are we doing? You know, what are we doing? Um, because that's just not what you did. You never ask questions. Um, and, yeah, and basically we just kept going until that, like, 38. And then, to be fair, we actually felt disappointed we didn't get to 40. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but at the time we were just like, oh, my God, I can't believe we've, we've got to that level. Um, and then he was like, oh, have the afternoon off and we'll, we'll see you back here in the morning. And we were just like, oh. And, you know, like a lot of people just go, they just don't believe like what we did. And I don't know, there's no, like to me, what's the rhyme or reason? Because you just, but the fact was that next time we went out and he said, oh, I was going to do like 1,500 and 250 or whatever it was for like the piece before. I think we were going to Munich or wherever it was that time. Um, and it was just so easy. You know, you're like, ah, oh, so it's only one, it's not 38. Um, and so you just learn over time that you're just pushing yourself beyond what you thought you could possibly do. Um, and yeah, it just makes you a better person. So. The only other coach I ever heard of doing a a session that was as mentally tough as you described was Mike Spracklin, and it came yeah, yeah. at Lucerne after Lucerne when the American eight got rode down in the sprint for the line by I think the Canadians. And apparently, the session they did the next morning was pretty much as you described, and he just beasted them until they felt like they'd died, and then just said, you never, ever, ever let anyone row through you and walked off. <laughs> and that was it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that's the thing with, like, with Dick is, like, he's going to probably do an amazing job with Canada because, um, 
like I'm I'm afraid because like they, uh, you know, I haven't I've heard from a couple of the, the older guys who were in the crew back in the day with who we raced against, and they seem to think the guys are in good spirits, but <coughs> they they. Mike is definitely like, from what I understand, Mike is very much like Dick, where it was just like shut your mouth, do what you're told, and and just go from there. And so if that's if that's the way, and sometimes the program needs to be like that for a while until you learn how to go fast, how to be really fit, like super super fit. You know, there's fit, there's really fit, and then there's super super fit. Um, and he'll get them to that level. You know, and they may not be fast starters, but they will definitely be there coming to the finish line. You know, just because of what the program is is how it works. Um, and it's also just, as I say, like the unpredictability of things where, um, you know, when you say things like that, you know, one of the other sessions that Dick used to do with us is you do like, you know, four 4K four pieces back to back on Karakura because we can, and you'd be like thoroughly, you know, it might be 28, 32, 34, 36, you know, open each one. And then you get back to the boathouse and everyone would be, you know, laying on the floor and having breakfast and, you know, maybe getting ready for a, a really light session to, to go and, um, you know, finish off the, the day on a Wednesday or a Saturday. And then Dick would come, like, rolling down and you go, oh, see you in the water in 15 minutes and you go back and do it again. You know, and you'd just be, like, looking at each other just with that trepidation, like, oh, my God, is he serious? Or, you know, what the hell's going on? And the fact was, and we learnt this from Rob Waddell, where um, Richard used to make him do, when he was in the single before Sydney, Richard used to make him do, like, 3,000-metre pieces about four days out, whatever it was. And Rob said he was, wasn't feeling that great and, you know, he was just a bit flat and whatever. So he went out and Dick was like, oh, I'll go do them and, and whatever. And, and Rob said he couldn't see him on the bank and he couldn't find him. And so he was like, oh, okay, he's not watching me. So he did them at like 32, 34 rating, just about 95%. And he said he came in, Dick wasn't around. He thought, oh, I must have gone home or rest on whatever. Um, and then... <laughs> He said he put his boat away and everything, and he came up to him like face to face and was like, "If you ever piss around like that again, um, I'm never going to coach you." And all this shit, like, had a full-on argument. He goes, "Get back in your boat and go out and do them again properly." So he made Rob go back out in his boat, do them again properly. And so basically, you learn things like that off people, and it's like if he tells you to do something, do it with the best intention. Don't question, just do it because, and and that's effectively almost what you would do with any coach. You know, don't. Don't say then why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Just bloody do it because there's a reason that you're doing it, um, and you may not like it, you may not enjoy it, um, and and generally you're only complaining whether you think it's too much. You know, if they said, "Oh, I just go and do 8k," you'd be like, "Sweet as," you know, no one's really going to complain, um, and and that's and that's how it works. So you know, just just don't have trust and have faith. We're just going to take a little break from the interview with Eric. Support for today's show comes from Health IQ, a life insurance agency who has the good common sense to realise that athletes are healthier than the average population. You don't have to explain why your body is a high quality, amazingly fit asset, or in Eric's phrase, super, super fit. You're 56% less likely to have heart disease if you're physically active. And of course, we know rowers are really physically active. Get special rates for your life insurance and show your support for Rowing Chat by visiting www.healthiq.com forward slash rowing and ask for a free quote. We know you enjoy Rowing Chat and so following through helps us cover our costs and to keep bringing you new episodes. We've also got support from Match Detergents for Sport. Have you ever thought that when we wash our sports kit over and over again, why has nobody ever invented a laundry detergent that's just gentle enough not to make your lycra go soft and your leggings become transparent? There are now two special products we've got in store on the Row Perfect shop. Pure One is sports laundry detergent, and Shield One is a wash-in waterproofing. So when your splash top has been through the wash a few times and it's no longer keeping you dry, try reproofing it with Shield One. You'll find both these products in the Row Perfect shop under the touring rowing category. Now, Derek, Cinnamon Pantry. Cinnamon Pantry. 
<laughs> Eric, we've got some questions from listeners and people who've got in touch on uh, online, and they've uh, asked a range of questions, mostly around technique. So here we go. Eric Murray on technique. How do you use your legs more in the rowing stroke? Because I struggle to engage a strong leg drive at the beginning of the stroke. Um, think about hanging under your armpits. So don't think about hanging in your shoulders. Um, don't think about hanging like across the top. Actually, just think about hanging under your armpits because effectively your arms are useless. Um, you know, they're so weak. They don't do really much at all in the rowing stroke except hold the pressure that you can do. You know, it's like doing a deadlift off the ground or a clean. If you're just hanging your arms, you're doing it. So if you can think about hanging your arms way out there and sort of leaving them out in front of you, that's the way that you'll get that connection through the whole torso um, onto your legs. Great. So there you go, Matt Ray. You've got your answer to that one. Now, here's one from Sebastian Prince, who thinks you're a complete legend. In fact, he knows you're a complete legend. And he says he dreams of being as good as you one day, and he's going to the Junior World Champs in August for South Africa in a Cox 4. He wants to know what advice you can give him with regards to his training and how to mentally prepare himself. Okay, um, mentally preparing for normal training, um, just have a realisation that it's probably going to suck a lot of the time because you're now training at a level that's required to be competing internationally, which is really hard. But you just got to get used to the amount that you're doing. So first and foremost, when you start, it'll be tough. Um, and then it just becomes normality. Uh, and then you just got to lift that intensity and go from there. As far as mental preparation goes for races, hey, you just got to find something that works for you. Your crewmates will all be different. Um, you know, I was a bit of a fidget. I couldn't sit still. Um, literally an hour and a half before the Olympic final, Hamish is laying in the corner with an eye mask on, earplugs in, trying to have sleep. Um, so those are the two different aspects that you get to it. Um, everyone's going to be nervous because if you're not nervous, the result and the outcome doesn't mean enough to you. Um, and so you just have to find a way to get your nerves and stuff under control. Um, so that's as far as racing goes. And hey, you know, you've just got to be flexible because you should try and get rid of superstitions. You should try and get rid of a whole lot of other different things because there's so many times where you can be late at the start, you can have a really short warm up area, uh, you don't get enough warm up in. So you're sitting there going, oh no, we, we haven't done enough. Um, and so that's just about finding out, you know, days beforehand, should we be doing more land-based, whether it's running, whether it's cycling, whether it's on the rowing machine, to just counteract in case anything goes wrong. Um, but yes, yeah, so, and if we go back to that training again, um, you've just got to be prepared that if you want to be the best, you have to work. And it has to be tough. You have to make it tough and you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Brilliant. Now one from someone on Twitter called Bombers33 who says, how do you get a good erg time? I'm training for senior did one and I've got two bigger kids trying to get me. I've been beating them in the past three years, but I'm now scared. <laughs> to get a better erg time. Um, the only way to get a better erg time is actually just to do a lot of ergs, um, dare I say it. And not only just do the ergs, but they have to be done with a reasonable intensity um, because the moment, it's, it's like training, you know, if you can train at 80% of your race speed consistently, you've only got to, you've only got to increase your output by 20% in order to, to win, right, to, to make it to 100%. So you want to be doing 80% of what your target goal is consistently all the time or higher, because that just means when you've got to do six and a half minutes or whatever you're trying to aim for, then it's just easy to go and only step up 15 to 20%. Whereas if you're just training along at sort of 70% of your target score, um, you've got to step up 30%, which is a massive step up. Um, and so it just takes long endurance stuff where, and I mean, you know, like you've got to be doing consistently 45 minutes to an hour of just trying to hold your numbers, you know, whatever it might be, if, you know, round figure 150, just sitting on 150 for as long as you can and keeping it on that, then a month or two down the track, you'll notice that all of a sudden you're doing low 149s, you know, and then all of a sudden you might be breaking into the 48s, you know, and so those are the things you've just got to do and then ultimately, you know, mix it up with some speed work, which your coach and everything will do, um, and that's the way to do it. So for first and foremost, it's, it is actually around intensity on the erg um, and keeping that up all the time. Did you ever keep a training diary so you knew what your numbers were? No, 
I wish I did. I've only got the sort of training data from what Dan and that collected, but um, I do have a list of like all my 2K times from since I was like 18, and it sort of comes down, down, big jumps, and then there's a couple in the middle that didn't really change much, and then I took a couple of months off, and then it went up, <laughs> and then it started coming down, and then the last sort of four years it just plateaued. It was just like I found my ceiling. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and to be fair, like I really – Looking back on it, another regret. Man, I've got a few of them now. Um, I really wish I'd done a 2K again in like August because we used to always do our 2Ks in March. That was our national trials, never did another one. Um, and so like my best was 541 and a bit um, in like 2011. And I used to always do around 542, 543 in March. Um, and but I never did one in August. You know, I missed sort of. Six, I'd only done six months of training. Did Nuke. I never did it near the end of the season. Um, you know, now you watch people like Josh Dunkley Smith and um, you know Mo Sibby and stuff in, in the UK, and you know that they've pushed under five forties. And I'm like, damn it! I, I think I might have been able to do it with that extra bit of training. But hey, that's that's just here or there. Yeah. So next question from the boys at Rotex Clothing. They said, 90 minutes low pulse versus erg spinning. What makes you first on the erg? Um, well, I just think you don't want to, like, to be fair, a lot of times I think you can, like, people can spend too much time on the row machine. Um, a lot of it is really just, as I say, about the intensity. You know, if you do 45 minutes at a really good intense pace, it's fine. Um, whereas, like, if you do 90 minutes, you have to really manage yourself and your your output actually has to come down in order to survive it. So I've always found that 60-minute period is about optimum to be able to do a good piece, which is really working you um, and and also giving you some, like, amazing benefits in the long term on your endurance, you know. And it's when I say 60 minutes, you know, it's a good five or six minutes warm-up beforehand and then it's just hitting your numbers bang from the first minute not going, oh, well, I'll take 10 minutes to warm up into it and then I'll sit on it. It's like 60 minutes of really good work. Good stuff. Now, from Kyle, on average during training through the year, how many kilometres did you row in a day? Uh, probably averaged, averaged anywhere between sort of 36 to 40. Um, those, those are probably a general number. Um, you know, like 20 to 24 kilometres for us was bread and butter. It's just... On Lake Karapira, you go up to this bridge, which is 20, like 11 kilometres one way and back again, and it was like, oh, I'll go to the bridge, and you just pretty much did that. Um, and so those were sort of the numbers that we do, and then you go back in the afternoon and you just go up to the, like the corner, which is like an eight and a bit K row. So there you get that, um, or you go around a little bit further and, and get some more numbers in. But those were generally in. I, I don't know if I, I don't like sort of saying it too much, but... <laughs> When we, when we changed the way we were doing things, we went from doing 200 plus Ks a week to doing like 140 to 160 a week. But we changed that with physiology and we ended up doing more time training. So we did two, two bikes a week, which was anywhere from two to three, four hours. And then we did three specific erg sessions a week where we hadn't done that prior. One of those was a good solid 60 minutes. The others were piece work. Um, and they were, some of them went longer than an hour. So we ended up doing doesn't matter about the Ks, it's a matter of the, the intensity, what you gain out of it. Um, yeah, those those are sometimes, you know, because your coach can say, you go and, go and do 20 Ks on the water and 10 Ks of it might be rubbish. You know, where they're better to go, why don't we just go 14 Ks on the water and I'll give you 2K to warm up and I'll want 12 Ks of solid, you know, and that's just, it's an hour, you know, like solid. And you'll be like, man, that was actually really worthwhile. So sometimes doing more, is not necessarily better, but you need to be able to have take the ownership that what you are doing is actually working. Good point. So a next one from Will Ruth. Um, he says the Kiwi pair doesn't lift is often banded around on the internet as a rationalization for a lack of strength training in other rowing programs, elite or otherwise. I've only been able to find passing mentions in interviews and articles, so I'd be interested to hear your own account. Did you ever do strength training? either body weight, bands, weights or so? And where does strength training fit or not fit into your philosophy? Um, yep, so from 2010, we stopped lifting weights. Um, so prior to that, we've done a lot. Um, and as I say, like, you know, you've got to grow and develop and grow your strength. 
Um, we started doing like speed endurance with like band work. Um, so you'd be doing this sort of plyometric stuff, which was, you know, fast or holding you to the ground or making it really springy. Um, but we basically got to a point and it was with Dick, the coach at the time, and he said, look, we're going to get faster by being fitter than we are by being stronger. You're spending two and a half, three hours in the gym a week and it's not really doing anything to what you're doing out on the water. So I think in our time when we started losing our explosiveness out of the start, that started from losing the power. So, yeah, we did lose a little bit of muscle mass, but the fact was that we were able to gain another three hours of training, and that's where these like high 200 numbers could come in because while everyone else was doing a weight session, we could do a rowing session. Um, and then we probably sometimes, a lot of times we did that with bungee work on the water. You know, you strap the hose pipe around the boat and do that. Um, so it worked for us, but it might not work for everybody else. I don't I don't think it would work for bigger boats. I definitely think it could work for singles and pairs and doubles. Um, but once you start getting into those boats where you need to have power, you need to be able to match people stroke for stroke out of the start, you can have amazing, like, unless you want to be like, oh, okay, that's fine, they can do a 123 first 500, we'll do a 125, and then we'll be able to make it up. But that you're already linked down, you know, and that mentally is like, oh, how are we going to make that up? So if you're confident, it's fine. Um, but, yeah, I definitely think in the early days you need to, to get to a level of strength. But as I say, you know, you spend, uh, you know, you get to, I don't know, mid, mid to late 20s in your career, um, and you spend a year trying to get the, the strength back to where you were prior to you finishing the previous year, and it's like, well, is that worth it? Um, and maybe it's an experimentation people need to take. I definitely think in the early years you need it, um, but as you get later in life and you've got that endurance in your legs and everything else, maybe it's worth looking at. Um, and it's also injury prevention because a lot of times you get injured by being in the gym going, yeah, I can squat more than you, and then, oh, well, there goes my back. You know, well, oh, I'm going to deadlift 200 k's off the floor just to try and make my, my max. Oh, man, my back's on it. You know, like those are those are the issues that come with it as you sort of get along. So, yeah, like we didn't in the last four years working up. We still did core work. Um, Hamish did a little bit of stuff on bungees and a few things for, for his injuries that he had. Um, but as far as I went, everything was on the water or on the rowing machine or on the bike. Let's talk about injuries. We haven't asked you about them. What was was there any time when you were seriously injured? No, I was. I've been pretty lucky. You know, I got a sore back on occasions. Generally, not from rowing, from doing dumb stuff like you know shifting furniture or digging holes in the garden, and then you're like, oh, that's not what I'm used to. Um, I jumped off the back of a truck carrying some furniture and I twisted my knee and. That sort of bugged me for a couple of years, but it wasn't as if it, it didn't really hurt. It just, if I did too much walking on it or I twisted it, I'd be like, oh, I feel that. And then I got that sort of sore too after Rio. Um, but yeah, I I flaunted one we rode with Dick and I got a bit of tendonitis in my wrist, so my wrist really blew up. Um, went and saw the surgeon ready to get it done, and they said, oh, we'll just keep rowing on it, it might go away, and it went away. <laughs> um, so, you know, like, I've, I've been pretty lucky. I never got any stress fractures. Um, yeah, and, and nothing that sort of kept me out of the boat too long, you know, day here and there, um, which which I guess is actually really good, you know, for the whole scheme of things. You know, you inevitable, you know, at the moment here in New Zealand, we're, we're pushing sort of low degrees in the morning. Um, you know, inevitable at this time of year, I always have a cold. You know, I always got a cough, and then your performance goes down a bit. And, and it takes you two weeks or more to shuffle. You know to, to get rid of it. um and and that's just what you have to do you know you don't have that that luxury of saying oh i'll take two days off and she might come right um you just have to like battle through it and that's the thing sometimes battling through injuries is good sometimes not so good but you want to just see what you can do and if it's going to be too serious or not got it now a question from john martin he said you were Taller, bigger, and stronger than Hamish. You also had more leverage in the bow seat. Yeah, How did you prevent the boat going round in circles? John, we've all wanted to know the right, answer. Now's your moment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, that's some secret squirrel stuff, man. Um, I'd love to give a presentation, and I'd love to show some of our force data and everything like that, because people would look at it and just go, nah, 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 that's a, like novice. That's novice, you know, because... We used to apply the power at slightly different times. Like I was behind Hamish all the time. Like we'd get to the water at the same time, but the the application of power was slightly behind 
Um, and, and to be fair, like Hamish was pushing, you know, if he was pushing 350 watts, um, I pretty much just had to do what he was doing in watts because if I tried to do any more, um, but the fact was that Hamish's engine, he was, he wasn't very, like, you know, we, yeah, we used to go a bit sideways out at the start and finish, but through the middle of the track, I was having to keep up with Hamish. So that's the thing, you know, his power to weight and even just outright power through the middle, like, K of a race was more than I could produce. You know, I'm, I'm dead set. I reckon he was producing 10 to 15 watts more than I could for that period of time. Um, and I was just managing to keep up. And and that's really what worked is we just found something that was just slightly off. And a lot of times you get coaches going, they, they, they look at that, you know, and it's a classic. You get your um, your printouts of your peach stuff and it's got your graphs on it and they'll be like, nah, you're not getting onto the power early enough. You're letting it off too much at the finish. You need to hold on to it longer and you need to get it off the front. And we'd go out and do it in a row and Hamish would go, this is horrible, I hate it. Go back to doing what you were doing. And then we'd go back to doing what we're doing, faster speed, and it would work. So in the end, we were like, okay, as long as we keep doing that, it's going to be fine. Um, and so, yeah, we used to be slightly out of time on our power application. Um, and our graphs used to, like, make this gap and it would come over and then slightly overlap and then they disappear again at the finish. Um, and that's what made us work, just that that learning, being slightly behind. And, hey, like, the, the stern used to fishtail quite a lot in the water, and I'm sure every single pair in the world does. I'm sure doubles, I'm sure fours, everything fishtail in the water. Um, and so we just had to find a way of making sure that that fishtail was really economical and efficient. Did you use steering wires? I steered. Yeah, so, yeah, just our, when, when we were in the four, when Chris started coaching us in 2005 and, and six. Um, he was like, you know, Hamish, you, I just want you to, to row hard. I want you to set the rhythm and go for it. And because I'd been in the crew and I'd steered, because I actually stroked on stroke side in bloody Athens, um, he just said, oh, well, you know how to steer. I'll give you the steering and three seat. So in the four, we had three uh, three seat steering, um, and that's how we did it. And then when we went to the pier, I just said, well, look, you just, you just do what you're doing, and I'll steer. Um, and then it also it did help a little bit because then I could say, well, if I'm – if I'm producing too much, I just steer it against me, and if not, then it went straight. And like, especially out of the start and finish, because then I could sort of add that little bit more power, but sort of steer. So it was a catch twenty two. What's what's wiping more? Is it is it worth not putting enough in, keeping the rudder straight, or is it keeping the rudder slightly turned, adding more power? What's actually giving us a better output? And you could man, I could manage that. Um, and so yeah, it was it was easy to do. I also like having the steering. <laughs> Now, Shauna says, how do you get noticed to start in Olympic training camps and eventually get to the Olympics? Ergs. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. Ergs. So, um, you know, every country I'm pretty certain will have, and New Zealand, you know, New Zealand's typical of that. Um, you know, if you want to get invited to New Zealand trials, you've got to hit an Erg number um, or else you've got to, like, win – uh, like two regattas in the country, which they call the small boat regatta, which is like a selection one where they want everyone in a single or a pair. Um, and so if you don't think you're going to be able to win the single or the pair because you're up against all the national team members, um, then basically you've just got to try and do it on the ERG and like get the ERG time that I you want. This can lead into this yep. And so, um, yeah, so basically that's, that's just what you have to do. So you have to learn how to be quick on the erg, um, and, and to be fair, um, you know, I blow people's bubbles all the time where they say, oh, yeah, but ergs don't float, and I say, yeah, but there's only one person that I know is an Olympic champion that wasn't that great on the rowing machine and won Olympic gold medal, and that was Joseph Sullivan, okay? He was mid-six minutes, you know, 6.04, I think, was his best, um, and he won Olympic gold medal, but he had heart and he had technique and he made up for that with a mongrelness on the water, whereas... Hamish does a 5.45, I do foot low 5.40s, Mahe does low 5.40s. If run in the British team, having it, there's probably an average of 5.40 and, oh, 5, you know, 5.40, The Germans have a low, foot, like a 5.50 average in the eight and the fours. So, hey, it's just it's just what you have to do, you know. If you want to be in those programs, you've just got to have the numbers. Which leads us on to Mary Thompson's question. What goes through your mind when you get to that stage in a 2K when you feel like dying and you're on the brink of passing out? Breathe. Um, yeah, breathe. So my opinions on ERGS, 2K especially, is um, basically you want to start out on your target number and use the rating to hold the speed. 
it may sound really bizarre, but if you can do, you know, we'll just use a round figure as if you're a guy and you want to do six minutes, you sit on 130 within five strokes of starting and you just tap it along and you think about your rhythm, your technique and your rating as you're just watching that number sit on 130. If it goes slightly above, you might need to add a little bit more power. If you do that, yep, I'm holding. If you're trying to add more power and it's not coming, add another point of rate because then effectively you're doing less watts per stroke, just more strokes. So you're working less, but more if that makes sense. Um, you know, and then you get to the thousand meter mark and it's basically all downhill, you know, and you just, if you have to put another point or two of rating there and then you have to put another point at the finish, you know, so you go from 34 at the start, 35, second 500, 36, 37, third 500, and then you've got to go 30 up plus for the last 500 meters, so be it. Um, but that's it, like, if you're doing an erg right, your power, and it's just like in a race, you get slower as it goes along. You know, like you get slower as it goes along and that's just nature. Um, and if you're able to manage it well on the row machine, you can go slower with, uh, with output each stroke, but you add more strokes, which gives you your end number. Brilliant, so that's your basically your erg race plan. I like Pretty that. Much. And uh, you know, like I know people like these, these um, you know, playlists and everything like that. And, and a lot of times I'm like, keep it out, just focus you on the machine. Maybe turn the force graph on the concept too, um, and then just listen to the machine. Listen to yourself. Listen to your breathing. Am I breathing enough? You know, how do I feel? And you know, am I coherent? Because um, if you if you feel like you're going to pass out, you're probably just not breathing enough. You know, suck in some big breaths. You know, short if you have to go hyperventilate a little bit for a while. Um, you know, and those are the things that you need to do. Brilliant. Last question. This is from Tomas Masaryk, who's from the Czech Republic. And he said he'd like to ask you which training composition is best because he heard that Andre Sinek trains with lots of intensive short workouts. Yeah, hey, as I say, we've we've only ever done a lot of endurance stuff in New Zealand. It's been a few times where we've done um, uh, like a different mixture, as I say, that 80-20, and then we went sort of like 60-40, um, and then obviously that 90-10 year that we did. And so, um, yeah, so basically that's just how we've done it um, over the time. So it works for some people because they do a massive endurance base over their winter and you'll find him, you know, maybe on his bike or on the rowing machine or out doing cross-country skiing. Um, and, and that's how it works. And so it works for him and then he just does short stuff on the, on the water for the last sort of three months um, and that works. So it works for him um, and that's what you sort of got to find over periods of time is what works for people. But you'll still find that he's extremely fit from the aerobic stuff that he's been doing, but he's spent six or seven months of doing aerobic stuff not actually on the water. Um, whereas down here in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, New Zealand, Australia, we can row 365 days a year. You know, we don't freeze over. Um, you know, okay, it gets cold in the winter, but by the time the winter rolls around, man, we're up in, in Europe, you know, and so when we come back from Europe, it's turning spring into summer in New Zealand. So we've got we've got a massive benefit here to be able to do that. So all our fitness is done on the water, but you'll find, you know, even with the Sinkoviches, you see, see them um, you see them in Croatia and then they'll go up in the mountains and do cross-country skiing for weeks on end and then they'll do erg camps. And same with the British, you know, they go do erg camps or they fly to South Africa. Okay, they've got a luxury of a budget to do that, but you just have to find ways to build that endurance space when you can't actually go rowing. Um, and then you find that your program's completely different. So, you know, that's how ours works and that's how his works. Now, you're in a very interesting stage of your life now because you're transitioning out of full-time sport into the rest of your life. You've got some pretty firmly held views about this as a point of principle for professional athletes. How's it going for you? Yeah, really good. You know, I was I had a, had a working life before I went into, uh, into rowing and so, and then while I was rowing in my earlier stages as an amateur, so... Um, I had opportunities that I could come out to um, afterwards, you know, and I've been really lucky. I used to work for the Kiwi International Rowing Skiss Company that built Rob and Mahe singles, and, and now we've taken on a, a new name of Laszlo Boats after the, the company got sold. Um, and so, yeah, I'm working there with relationship building, um, you know, doing sales and, and talking to people because it was sort of the industry that I moved into when I was first in Carapiro. Um, and I had that to fall back on, you know, and, and at the same time, I was lucky enough to have sponsors and, and we do a lot of speaking events for corporates and other things as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's opportunities. Um, and I definitely think that, you know, it's, it's one thing to watch because as we start getting really professional, there's a lot of people that, yeah, they might be doing studying and stuff at the same time, but 
it doesn't beat the practicality of working in, in the real world, basically. So you can be an Olympic champion and have, have a degree under your belt, but if you haven't worked a day in your life, then you basically go back to that sort of just above intern level. Um, and I think that's what people find hard, um, is doing that step where they've come out of the top and they've been on one Everest, and then all of a sudden they're at the base of Nepal and they're like, oh, okay, now I've got to build back up to that top. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I'm sure it's the same for everybody. And, some people find it harder than others, but as I say, if you can if you can find a really good balance while you're training, and then it makes it easier when you when you move into the working life. Eric, it's been a delight talking to you. Thank you for being so generous with your time, and uh, we'll see what we can do to get a few people reading your book as well. Tell people where they can connect with you online. Um, yeah, so we've got I've got Instagram. It's just Kiwi Pear Eric, um, and then Facebook is the Kiwi Pear. Um, and yeah, we're pretty prolific on Kiwi on, on those ones. There's also we're on Twitter as well. Kiwi Pears on Twitter. Um, but I think if you're looking to buy our book, there's a there is, and I should have had the link with me, but I don't. Um, there is a company called the Book Depository, and so you can buy it off the Book Depository and um, just Google it and search Kiwi Pear. And I think they actually have free worldwide shipping. So um, wherever it comes from, I think it's from the publishers in Australia. Um, and you'll get it sent out to wherever you are. So it's a, I think it's a reasonably good read. I haven't heard too many bad comments about it. So I, it, no one, no one said it to my face. What about, what, what about you, Rebecca? <laughs> it has moments of being a complete page turner. The bits that I empathise most with are the bits that paralleled my own rowing career. Obviously, yeah. I've never been a rowing professional. Um, but it also, what I enjoy is the insight into a job of work that is rowing and oh. for me i've never experienced that so it's it, it you've had some unique times which no other athlete has had mm. because you are you yeah. and you know hamish is hamish and that's been great that you've documented it because you know maybe sometime there will be someone who'll do more than you or win more than you I hope so. Yeah, exactly. I hope so too, because that's the way sport is. But what I enjoy is feeling that there's a small part of me that's done something that's pretty similar to you. And I think other yep. readers will enjoy that too. Nice. Till next time, everybody. Goodbye.